I am Dr. Jason Johnson, one of the Pediatric Cardiology Fellows at Duke University, and this is on transposition of the great arteries. This presentation will go over the incidence of transposition of the great arteries and the pathophysiology with the clinical features. I will also discuss how the diagnosis of transposition of the great arteries is made and the management of these patients. The incidence of transposition of the great arteries is 0.3 per 1,000 live births and actually accounts for 5% of all types of congenital heart disease. Transposition is more common in infants of diabetic mothers and this is not completely understood. There are more male children affected with transposition of the great arteries with a 3 to 1 male to female ratio. Like other forms of congenital heart disease, transposition of the great arteries is associated with the George syndrome, which is usually caused by chromosome 22Q11 deletion. The pathophysiology of transposition of the great arteries is fascinating. The aorta arises from the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery arises from the left ventricle, hence the name transposition of the great arteries. The great vessels of the heart essentially are connected to the incorrect ventricle. Therefore, desaturated blood returning from the body to the right side of the heart or the right ventricle goes inappropriately out the aorta and back to the body again. Consequently, oxygenated pulmonary venous blood returning to the left side of the heart or the left ventricle is returned directly to the lungs. This creates a major problem with both the systemic and pulmonary circulations existing as two parallel circuits. As you can see, this results in systemic cyanosis because the deoxygenated blood returning from the body is pumped right back to the body before receiving oxygen from the lungs. This is a figure and it depicts the physiology of transposition of the great arteries. First, we will go over visually the anatomy of transposition of the great arteries that we discussed in the last slide. The superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava connect normally to the right atrium that fills normally into the right ventricle. So far, this is normal. However, in patients with transposition, the aorta arises from the right ventricle, which is the case in this figure. Now direct your eyes to the left side of the heart and notice that the pulmonary veins connect normally to the left atrium that empties normally into the left ventricle. However, the pulmonary artery arises from the left ventricle. To completely understand the physiology and how children survive with this lesion, we need to discuss cardiac output and mixing of the circulation. The circled numbers represent oxygen saturation values. The right atrial oxygen saturation is decreased secondary to systemic hypoxemia. Desaturated blood enters the right atrium, flows through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, and is ejected into the transposed aorta with resultant severe aortic desaturation. Fully saturated pulmonary venous blood flows into the left atrium, across the mitral valve into the left ventricle, and across the transposed pulmonary artery into the lungs. Pulmonary arterial oxygen saturation is thus increased. Blood is required to shunt via two fetal pathways, the patent foramen ovale, or PFO, and the patent ductus arteriosus, or PDA. The PFO is the opening between the left and right atrium, and the ductus arteriosus is the connection between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Because systemic vascular resistance tends to be higher, then pulmonary vascular resistance, blood shunts across the PDA mostly from the aorta to the pulmonary artery. The increase in pulmonary blood flow promotes left atrial to right atrial shunt through the PFO, increasing the content of oxygenated blood to the aorta. Thus, an unrestricted atrial communication improves oxygen saturations and is vitally important to the survival of these infants. The clinical manifestations of patients with transposition of the great arteries are dominated by finding associated 
with systemic desaturations. This results in cyanosis and tachypnea that are recognized within the first hours of life. Hypoxemia is usually moderate to severe. This fact completely depends upon the degree of atrial level shunting. In patients with minimal atrial level shunting, they are severely cyanotic with oxygen saturations 50 to 60 percent. However, in patients with large amounts of atrial level shunting, they can have saturations of 80 to 90 percent and be relatively stable. Another classic finding of transposition of the great arteries is the second single heart sound. The second heart sound is typically intermittently split due to the delay in blood from the right side during respiratory variation. However, when the aorta is anterior to the pulmonary valve and connected to the right ventricle, the splitting is no longer heard. In patients with transposition of the great arteries, we would not expect to hear any murmurs. However, this lesion is commonly associated with valvular problems and septal defects. Therefore, the physical exam can reflect these other abnormalities. For instance, a systolic ejection murmur will be noted in patients with a stenotic semilunar valve. A holosystolic murmur will be noted in patients with a ventricular septal defect. As we discussed in previous slides, making an accurate and timely diagnosis of transposition of the great arteries is extremely important. A 12-lead electrocardiogram is typically normal. Therefore, a normal electrocardiogram never rules out any type of congenital heart disease. The chest x-ray will show mild cardiomegaly and a narrow mediastinum, giving it the classic egg-on-a-string heart. I will show you a picture of this example on the next slide. The transthoracic echocardiogram is the diagnostic test of choice. Not only can the anatomy be confirmed, but the size of the interatrial communication and the ductus arteriosus can be visualized. Echocardiogram will give you anatomic as well as physiologic information. Cardiac catheterization is typically not used for diagnostic purposes unless there is a complicated case to define coronary artery anatomy prior to surgery. However, this modality is absolutely essential for emergency balloon atrial septostomy. We will discuss this life-saving procedure in more detail in the coming slides. Here are some images from different modalities discussed on the previous slide. The left image shows a chest x-ray with mild cardiomegaly, a narrow mediastinum, giving the egg-on-a-string appearance. There is also normal to increased pulmonary blood flow. The top right image shows an echocardiogram demonstrating transposition of the great arteries. The pulmonary artery, labeled PA, can be seen arising directly from the left ventricle, labeled LV. The immediate bifurcation of this great vessel into the branch pulmonary arteries, labeled RPA and LPA, for right pulmonary artery and left pulmonary artery, respectively, differentiates it from the aorta, which branches more distally from the heart. The bottom right image shows an echocardiogram demonstrating the pulmonary artery arising from the left ventricle and the aorta arising from the right ventricle. This image gives a visualization of the parallel nature of the anatomic great vessels and should remind you that the circulation is also in parallel in this disease. The management of neonates with transposition of the great arteries centers around promoting mixing of the circulation that is in parallel. Said another way, the oxygenated blood needs to make it to the right ventricle to be pumped to the body. Infusion of prostaglandin should be initiated immediately to maintain patency of the ductus arteriosus. Prompt correction of acidosis and hypoglycemia is also essential. In patients with transposition of the great arteries and an intact ventricular septum, the size of the interatrial communication is the most important factor for promoting mixing of the two circulations. This is typically accomplished by the Rashkin balloon atrial septostomy. This procedure is used in infants with severe hypoxemia and a restricted atrial communication. As you remember from the previous slide, the balloon atrial septostomy is accomplished by cardiac catheterization. Venous access is obtained typically in one of the femoral veins and a special catheter with a balloon tip is positioned across the patent foramen ovale into the left atrium.
This is an image of four frames from a continuous cine angiogram that show the creation of an atrial septal defect in a hypoxic newborn infant with transposition of the great arteries. The image labeled A, the balloon is inflated in the left atrium. The catheter course is in the inferior vena cava and to the right atrium across the patent foramen of alley and ending in the left atrium. The image labeled B, the catheter is jerked suddenly so that the balloon ruptures the foramen of alley. Then in the image labeled C, the balloon is seen in the inferior vena cava. Finally, in the image labeled D, the catheter is slightly advanced into the right atrium to deflate the balloon for removal. It should be noted that the time from A to C is less than one second. The only definitive treatment for transposition of the great arteries is surgical repair. The Jatine arterial switch operation is the surgical treatment of choice. The procedure involves doing exactly what the name implies. The great vessels are transected just distal to the valves and switched so that they are in the correct place. The coronary arteries are then mobilized as buttons and attached to the new aortic valve. This is usually performed within the first two weeks of life, when the heart is the size of a plump strawberry, to allow the left ventricle to generate adequate pressure to pump blood to the high-pressure systemic circulation. The timing of surgery within the first two weeks is also because when pulmonary vascular resistance drops, the pressure in the left ventricle also declines, and this results in a decrease in left ventricular mass. Therefore, if surgical correction waits, the left ventricle will not be conditioned to pump to a high-pressure system. This results in left ventricular failure. The other surgical option is the atrial switch operation, or the mustard or sinig operation. This technique involves baffling the atrial blood over to the opposite ventricle, essentially fixing the circulation. However, this leaves the right ventricle as a systemic pumping chamber receiving oxygenated blood baffled over from the left atrium. The atrial switch has excellent early survival at 85 to 90%, but significant long-term morbidities that include sick sinus syndrome, atrial flutter, sudden death, and superior or inferior vena cava syndrome. All of these problems develop due to the incision of the atrial tissue. However, the biggest long-term problem with the atrial switch is that it leaves the right ventricle as a systemic pumping chamber, and it often begins to fail in young adulthood. It is for these reasons that the arterial switch is a surgical repair of choice in patients with transposition of the great arteries. The prognosis of transposition of the great arteries is good after repair. The survival after the arterial switch operation at 18 months is 95%. The complications that arise after the arterial switch operation include inadequate coronary perfusion related to anatomic obstruction, stenosis at the anatomic sites of the great arteries, pulmonary artery stenosis, and left ventricular failure in late repair. The pulmonary artery stenosis develops due to complications from the Lecompte maneuver where the pulmonary arteries are draped over the ascending aorta. This typically causes stretching of the pulmonary artery and they subsequently develop stenosis as a child grows. These are references to three book chapters that summarize transposition of the great arteries very well and will supplement this presentation nicely. Thank you for your time.